All right, well, we'd like to welcome you to RU Recovery's third talk. This is where God talks to us through the preaching of his word. We want to welcome all that are joining us on WBTV 107.9 FM and also our live stream viewers at gracecalvary.com. And we are Erie's only addictions and emotional strongholds teaching us live on the radio and live streaming. And if you do miss us, you can find us on our YouTube channel at Erie RU Recovery. And please click subscribe if you like. And um, I know it's been being shared around, so we're getting more subscribers. But tonight's text is going to be Luke chapter 12, verse 15. If you have a, uh, a student resource guide, uh, we're on page 38. And honestly, we're crawling through this. But um, the Lord just keeps opening up things out of this verse. Um, and I pray that it'll be a help to you. Title of tonight's message is, What Does Your Life Consist Of? What does your life consist of? But here in Luke chapter 12, and verse number 15, the Bible says, And he said unto them, Take heed, and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. And let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the evening. We thank you for another opportunity to open up the word. And Father, I pray that we will be open to it that we would be ready to receive what you have for us tonight, that we would be changed and challenged, and that we would be conformed to the image of your, your dear son just a little bit more so that we can show a lost and dying world that there is a way, and that it is the way, that is Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. And tonight we're looking at uh, what our life consists of, Father, I pray that we would take a hard look, not at what others are doing, but what we are doing. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So this little phrase here, what a man's life, cons a man's life consists not, kind of really grabbed a hold of me. And I, I asked myself, Dennis, what does your life consist of? Amen. And in, in looking at this, at this message, I also asked, what does your life consist of? If someone was to observe your life, what, could, what would he say that your life consists of? What would your family say that your life consists of? And I'm not talking, well, he reads his Bible every day. He does this. I want to know what you are doing with what you're reading. What does our life consist of? What does your life and my life consist of? The word consist of means to be composed or made up of. And I ask yourself this question, or better yet, ask someone you trust. If I were to look at my life, what would others say my life consists of or is made up of? Who am I really? What do others see? Or better yet, what does God see? Or what does God know? Would they say God is very important to him or her? And I ask all of us because I think we all want God to be important to us, don't we? Amen? Can we, can we say that? But just because I show up does not equal in reality what is the case. Some people say, well, well he serves all the time. And service is, is important. Being in church may be important to us. Being at RU might be important to us. But is your relationship with God important? You know, we all have subjects that are important to us. I could go down through the line and I know what's important to so-and-so. And I, can, I know what's important to each and every one of us. You guys know what's important to me. But I want us to look in Matthew chapter 6. And verse number, verses 1 and 5, Matthew, chapter 6. The Bible says, Take heed that you do not your alms before men, to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues 
and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. You know, we often covet what men see of us. Listen, I, I, I was there. I did not miss a service. I did not miss something that was going on here at church. And I'm not saying that we, that we should, but what I'm getting at, are we doing it for the sole purpose of, Dennis is there every service. Why am I here every service? Why am I here at RU every Friday? Why, do I, why am I doing what I'm doing? Is it to be seen of men, or is it to actually build my relationship with the Lord? Matthew chapter 23, verse, verse, uh, verse 5. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 5. All therefore, actually look at verse number, number 3. Number 2, same. Okay, let's go to number one because we'll just get the context here. <laughs> then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not after their works. For they say, what does it say? And do not. See, we talk, we talk to people about Jesus. We talk to them about reading their Bible. And then we don't do it. Right? We talk, we talk a lot, but we don't do a lot. Look at verse 4. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. They'll say, just have faith, brother. Just but when they go through a situation, they have no faith. They crumble. They're falling all over the place. But they know exactly how you, you ought to do it. Listen, I'm going to be straight up with you. Observe people's lives and go to get counsel from people that are actually going through things and doing what the Bible says. Don't go to someone that just has the answers. Go to someone that has answers and life that matches it. Verse 5, but all their works do they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge their borders of their garments and love the uppermost most rooms at the feast and chief seats in the synagogues. See, like I said, we often covet being seen of men. Covet, we covet to know that I did my duty serving. But I want to, I want to tell you, if that's all you're doing, that, that's what religion produces in a person. A sense of doing, therefore I am, or I've done what's expected. Again, if, I see, if someone you trust were to give an assessment of your day-to-day -day activities, what would they say you consist of? What are you made of? Oh, their kids and their grandkids are everything to them. Wrong focus. I have grandkids. They're wonderful. They're great when they go home, you know. No, I'm just kidding about that. I love my grandchildren. But the fact of the matter is, my grandchildren do not come before my Lord and Savior. My children don't come before my Lord and Savior. My Lord and Savior comes first. The principles that he lays down in his book come first. Many in today's society look to those with abundance of things as their test of success. 
Many look at the position someone holds. Oh, they're, they're a doctor. Oh, they own such and such a business. I'm, I'm t- friends, I know, I know people that have millions of dollars, and I would not want their life. I wouldn't want it. I don't want the responsibilities. I don't want the things that they have to deal with. I'm thankful for what God's given me. I remember when, I, when we used to travel a lot, my kids would, would say, that's my house, or that's, that's my, my truck, or that's my, and we, they would like lay like, like claim to it. And we'll say, well, that, that's just a game. I didn't take it that way. You can ask, ask my wife. And that mentality inserts into the heart a covetous attitude. I, I cut it off. I said, don't, I said, I said, yeah, I said, you might have those things, but I said, those things will have you, and it will be covetous heart rather than a heart toward God. I said, God will send leanness to your soul. 1 Timothy 6.5. Let's look there for a moment. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 5. Well, let's look at verse 3 through 5. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine which is according to godliness, what's it say? He's proud. Knowing nothing but doting about questions and strife of words whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of truth, And this is what they say, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Dennis Stambro for a moment here. What a man has does not impress me, honestly. Not hardly at all. What a man is, who he is, how he conducts himself as a man, that means something to me. Or you can insert woman in there too. Well, I have not been taught how to conduct myself properly. I grew up on the streets. I, I hear all kinds of excuses. All of us can live more godly. All of us. Will it be to the same character that someone else that you look up to has? might not be, but you can be more godly than you were yesterday, right? Or a week ago, or a month ago. If there's no change in your life, you, you need to check yourself. You need to check, am I really saved? Do I really love the Lord? Do I? It's gotta be, there, there should be some change. There should be some conviction that's happening because I'm not doing what I ought to do. See, only Christ can take a man or woman and change them. But it also requires a cooperation. Everything we need to be and what Christ wants us to be are written within the pages of this book. Everything. See, the problem is we seldom... See, we say we love the Bible, but we seldom open it. We seldom study it. And we seldom apply it. Second Peter, verse three. Keep yourself here in, in Timothy because we're coming back here. But Second Peter, verse chapter one, verse three. It says, "According as the divine power hath given unto us all things that what pertaineth unto life." Now that's where the world usually stops, right there. You say, bless God, he's given me everything that pertaineth to life, given me everything I need. But it goes on to say, and godliness. And it tells how? Through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And then it goes on to tell us what we should be adding to our, to our faith. 
God has given us an instruction manual. I'll hear, oh, I, I can't learn. I, I, I really have a hard time memorizing things. I really have a hard time. Listen, I can go through or you can go through anyone's life and know what is important to them. Know what they memorize. And I say this a lot. And I'm amazed. We remember movie quotes like that. <laughs> One time we hear it. And we're spouting it off four months later. Do you remember in... Something's wrong with that. We all have subjects that are important to us, hobbies that are important to us. We got trained in our jobs and remember things pertaining to them. Because if we didn't, we'd be out of a job. And we make sure that we learn because of the almighty dollar. Yet we desire, you know, we desire to know more about Jesus, yet we neglect our Bible. We fail to practice. We talk about, about it, but we but don't do what we talk about. Often we say we trust God, but others may say so-and-so is always in panic mode. Here's a scriptural principle here in, in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 25. It says, be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. Now look at verse 26. For the Lord shall be what? Thy confidence. That's why he says not to be afraid of sudden fear. Because our confidence is in the wrong thing. When, See, the fear comes, but I don't have to move right away. Right? Listen, I haven't had, by the grace of God, had health problems, but I know some people that have had, had cancer and, and, and other things. Listen, when those words come, that strikes fear in the heart. I can't even imagine. But the fact of the matter is, we can sit back and rest in the Lord and say, Lord, what would you have me do? How would you have me be? What would you have me? I mean, there's horrific situations going on in people's lives that strike fear. But the Lord can help us through that. He can be our confidence. In our workbook here, Letter A, God has promised to meet our needs. Philippians 4.19 says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And I ask you, do, do we believe this verse? Maybe my God is a small g. And he doesn't supply for me, but their God... Large G supplies for everyone else but me. How often do we do it? Well, he's blessing so-and-so, and he's blessing so-and-so, and he's blessing so-and-so. That's when that verse popped up in my head. I mean, that song popped up in my head that I shared earlier. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Maybe our focus is on coveting others' things or others lives and we fail to miss miss what God is actually doing in our lives but my life is in turmoil right now and the sea of life is raging well turn through the Matthew very familiar story Matthew chapter 14 I think I remember a man that actually walked on water Peter walked on water but look look here he says in, in Matthew chapter 14, verse 29, and he said, actually, let's look at verse 28. And, Lord, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me 
come unto thee on the water. But look at verse 27. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. What does he say? Be not afraid. Is that fear again, right? One verse, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if thou bid me to come unto thee on the water. And verse 29, he says, come. And when Peter was come down out of the water and ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. One more verse. But when he saw the wind, boisterous, he was what? Afraid. And begin, beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And the Lord was gracious. In verse 31, he immediately stretched forth his hand and saved him. But Peter saw everything around him, and he didn't even realize, I'm actually walking on water. I can't even, I've never done that. I, would, I don't even know if I would like to do that. But the fact of the matter is, Peter walked on water. And we, and we kind of just read over those verses and stuff, and uh, he just walked on water. And, and Peter did the same thing. He didn't even realize what God was doing. He's walking on water, but, oh, but the storm and the sea took his focus off of Jesus. And Jesus became small and the storm became big. Peter started out well, but because, because he, and be, but became overwhelmed by what was going on around him. And we do the same thing. We do it through covetousness, through what's going on in others' lives, instead of minding our own business, and growing in our own Christian walk. I think I remember a verse, I, I was going to look it up, but it talks about us not to meddle in other men's affairs. See, we're more apt to help others with their problems, but do nothing about our problems. It's kind of like we want a better life, but we procure a bitter life. We know what everyone else should do, but don't have a clue what to do in our own life's adversities. And we'll say, hey, brother, trust God. Yet we're in a panic, and we're sinking. See, P Peter cried, Lord, save me. And that word save means keep me safe and sound and to rescue me from danger or destruction. Peter was in a crisis, there's no doubt. And many of us are in crisis mode and actually applying crisis faith. But my friend, crisis faith does not always translate to sustaining faith. In Philippians 4.19, God has promised to meet our needs. He has given us all things that pertain to the life of godliness according to 2 Peter. And unfortunately, we want all that pertaineth to life, but we don't learn the godly. But other things, about other th many other things, you know, we'll, we'll study all kinds of stuff. I, li I like to read stuff about fitness. I like to read things on hunting. I, there's all kinds of other things that will, will take my focus off, off of what, what I should be doing. We'll memorize and study the other things, but when it comes to God's word, to godliness, or to applying biblical principles, we fall short. We, we kind of disconnect. We, we won't do the work or do the study of that. We apply the known course of action in the intellect, but it doesn't get to our heart and actually become reality. We know what to do here, in my head, but we don't put our feet or our hands to the task. We neglect the Bible and we flounder and we fret. We don't have to, but that's what we do. We, we, we want to follow, we don't want to follow counsel either. In Matthew chapter, chapter 9, verses 11 through 13, And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto the disciples, Why eat your master, 
eateth your master with publicans and sinners. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Now listen to this, verse 13. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I've had people call me early morning hours, 2, 3 in the morning in a, in a crisis. And they're, they're, expecting, they're expecting me to give them the answers. You know what I've done? I'll say, open your Bible. And I'll give them a scriptural reference. And I says, now, is this what I want you to do? I says, I want you to read that passage of scripture. I says, and I want you to, to uh, do what we've been trying to teach you on Friday nights and what Pastor Alkus has been preaching for years. I want you to actually go through the scriptures and tell them and, and expound out of it what it says. They said, okay, I'll do that. I says, no, I don't understand. I says, you go do that and then call me back. As in, if you call me back in five minutes, I says, I'm not answering the phone. They said, what do you mean? I says, no, because it's going to take you a good hour to study that and know what it, and go find out what that meaneth. Amen. As because you can call me all day long and I can keep giving you the answers, but it's going to be, it's going to keep coming around, coming around because you don't know what to do. It does that to quite a few people. They don't call me as much. <laughs> Why? Because I made them do the work. Why do I have to do the work? I, I could give you a fish, but it would be better if I taught you how to fish, right? Amen. So, I, I, can, I could dig a ditch for you, but when you actually dig the ditch yourself, you understand the labor that goes into digging that ditch, Right? You understand the sweat. Well, that, that's the problem today in modern day Christianity. We don't want to dig. Right. We want others to dig for us. And we don't actually ever learn anything. The RU curriculum can be used as a guide to help us in, the des in that desire. But it takes work. And I'm, I, learning's hard. It goes against the grain. It's hard to, to teach an old dog new tricks. But we, we, we say that adage, but the adage does not say that it's impossible to teach an old dog new tricks, does it? It says it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. It doesn't mean he can't learn it might take a little bit longer to learn. And I, I submit to you, embrace the learning curve. Go and learn. Go and apply what you've learned from God's Word. Remember this book, and that this book has the answers, all that pertaineth to life and godliness. And I tell you, I, godliness brings many blessings. First, First Timothy chapter 2. Let's turn there for a moment. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. Let's look at verse 1. I exhort therefore that the first that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now listen here. For kings and for all that are in authority. We, we generally complain about the kings or all that are in authority. But this is telling us to pray for them. That we may lead what? A quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Listen, godliness will, 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 will lead a, a quiet and peaceable life because of that. Let's look at ch chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, verse 7. Paul's instructing this young man, verse 7 of chapter 4. He says, but refuse profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself rather to what? Godliness. And verse 8 says, bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable to what? All things. Having the promise of life 
that now is and of that which is to come. So in Philippians, God has promised to meet all of our needs, and he has given us... Oh, I just repeated another... Flip the page, and I didn't go to where I wanted to go. Let's turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, on this idea of, of godliness. It says, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strife of words whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmising, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw themselves. But look at verse 6. But godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. See, if we, don't con if we consent not to wholesome words, that's the sound words, ones that are wealth, then he goes on to say, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to godliness. If we do not consent to this, we're proud. And we don't know anything. We might know all kinds of scriptures, but we really don't know. In verses 4 and 5, it says, he's talking about supposing that gain is godliness. That word gain means acquisition. We think that gaining things, acquiring things is, is, is godliness. It says, withdraw yourself from a person like that. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. You know, we get really anxious about not thinking our needs are going to be met. Don't we? And a lot of people do. You know, I have people come come here often, uh, not just for RU, with RU, but for, for church, and they're, they're, they'll ask for money, uh, different things and stuff like that. And um, sometimes we meet those needs, sometimes we don't. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, they come in, they're, 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 they're anxious. And uh, they're, listen, the world, takes, the world will take care of the world. There's so many programs out there that will, will, will take care of things. I've dealt with people, they'll go down to GCAC, and they'll, They'll actually, if, if the money's there, they'll set up a whole apartment. They'll give them a stipend, $700, $800 to go set up an apartment. There's programs out there for that. I want to, my heart is to give you godliness because it pertains to all things. To help you make proper decisions and, and do things right. But here in, in, in Matthew, he says, Therefore I say, unto you. Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is, now here's, here it is, is not your life more than meat and the body than raiment? Listen, I'm not being, I'm, this is going to sound funny, but I promise you that all of us could afford to miss a week's worth of meals and still be here. We might be a little angry at the end of the process, but the fact of the matter is we would all survive, wouldn't we? Listen, I would survive without the closet full of clothing that I have. Amen. I would. You would. Right? <coughs> I would survive without having the latest whatever. That's not what my life consists of. I was telling someone, I said, if you want a shallow relationship, then 
then that's what you'll get. If you only talk to me about one subject all the time, and that's all the further you want to go in a, in a relationship, I'm much deeper than that. And the Lord's way deeper than that. He doesn't want us just to come to him with our problems. He wants to have a conversation with us daily. And not us whining and complaining about everything. He wants us to praise him. That's why our testimony time is so important. Praise him for what he's doing in our life. If you can't see it, you know what, know what that means? You, you, can't, you can't see. You need to have the scales lifted off your eyes and really see what the Lord's doing in your life. There's more to life than food and raiment or clothes, the outer garment. The Lord wants to get into the heart. It's out of the heart are the things that defile a man, not what goes, not what goes in, right? So back to what I was saying. What a man or woman is is more important than what they say they are. When they're going through through tough times. Where's your faith? Show me your faith by my works, right? I understand. It's hard. To, some things are very hard to go through. And I leave you with these questions. What does your life consist of? What would others say that your life consists of? And most importantly, what does God know that your life consists of? Amen. Let's bow forward to prayer. Just got a couple questions for you. We're going to open up the altar. We don't have a piano player tonight, but maybe you're listening on live stream or you're, you're uh, on the radio. And be honest with yourself. My life, if I'm honest, consists of things that do not promote godliness. My household consists of things do, that do not pertain to godliness. Thirdly, maybe you're hearing you say, or you're listening, I'm afraid I have a covetous heart, and I'm not content with the things that I have. And maybe you're listening, you're, you're not actually saved. The Bible says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You may not even be able to see that these things. You, you, you may know in your mind what godliness looks like, but you're not willing to do what godliness is. See, if you're not saved, you don't have the power within yourself. You don't have the Holy Spirit residing within to produce those works in you. But if you're here and you're saved, you have a power in you that you haven't tapped into to be able to live this way. And he's just waiting for you to yield yourself to him. He's waiting for you to do dive into the word so he can remind you of all things that pertain to life and godliness and to help you. But we have to make the decisions. So we're going to open up the altar for a moment. Anyone that would like to like to pray, you can come to the altar. If you're uh, listening on live stream or on the radio, and uh, you would like to have more information about how to be saved, write us. Especially if you're on the on the website, uh, email our pastor. Uh, you that are on the radio, there's going to be an opportunity. Uh, our pastor's going to come on after after we're done here, and he's going to explain the plan of salvation to you, and they'll give you an opportunity to trust Christ as your Savior. If you do that, please find us on, on the Internet and, and write us, email us, let us know that you did that, and then perhaps come and visit us. We'd like to rejoice with you that, that you have a home in heaven and uh, we'll give you an opportunity to, to, to see what the Lord has done here at Grace Calvary Baptist Church. Father, we thank you for the evening, and we thank you for all that you 
that you do for us. Father, I pray that you help us to uh, have a life that uh, consists of more than the things that just interest us uh, and are, are leaving us uh, shallow and without depth to our Christian life. Father, I pray that you help us to, to dive into your word and to dig out those nuggets, those things that pertain to, to, uh, to life and godliness, things that will help us uh, to all things. Father, uh, we just pray that um, because of being godly, we will serve you. But Father, I pray that we're, if we're just serving and not having a dynamic relationship with you, Father, help us to see that that is more important to have that dynamic relationship because the ministry will, uh, will bring pressures that um, will mount and we will, will act, act out in our, our flesh, we'll walk after the flesh and end up doing more damage to uh, your reputation and ours as, as what true Christianity is. But Father, help us to see the need to uh, be in, in, in the scriptures to uh, search them, them diligently and daily. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.